Great white sharks. Can their behavior reveal clues about carbon sequestration in the North Atlantic? On the Atlantic Ocean off Cape Hatteras, two sharks, dubbed Lydia and Mary Lee, were tagged with satellite positioning transmitters. These transmitters allowed APLUW research scientist Peter Gawe to track the movements of the sharks. He was surprised by what he found. And what was really fascinating, we started to look at this, and, and we hadn't really seen this before, was that the sharks spent a significant amount of time out in the middle of the ocean. And when they went offshore, they didn't just randomly swim around. It was a very obvious movement that involved circular motions. And they were of the right size that were reminiscent of the mesoscale eddy field. When we uh, speak about mesoscale eddies, what we mean are these rotating bodies of water. They make up the weather of the sea, right? So these are the hurricanes of the ocean. What the eddies do is they're swirling, they're mixing stuff together, but they're actually swirling so fast that they effectively trap a large mass of water in the center. And in there you have an ecosystem, and that ecosystem can be quite different than an ecosystem you find outside the eddy. What's quite fascinating is why would the sharks want to spend more time in these eddies? What we saw is not only were they using the eddies, but they had a preference for a specific type of eddy, which is what we call an anticyclonic eddy. And what we see in these eddies is that generally they have lower primary production. So the water in these eddies is a little warmer. It's lower in nutrients, generally. One of our leading hypotheses was that the anticyclones are warmer. So it's just a, a place where they can dive deeper and stay longer and, and forage for longer. But there's likely also another reason, which is that the foraging, so the food, what they're trying to get is maybe more abundant or in higher densities in anticyclones. And so that's where, on the NAMES program, we're using the acoustics to sort of characterize the organisms in these deep scattering layers. And this project is funded by NASA, and they have a real interest in looking at the evolution of the spring bloom, in particular the North Atlantic, because it can have really profound impacts on the sequestration of carbon. So as phytoplankton bloom, you have a lot of CO2 being absorbed by the phytoplankton community. That's carbon that was taken out of the atmosphere and is effectively buried in the deep ocean, which is one mechanism by which we can reduce the CO2 in our atmosphere. To build on the clues offered by shark behavior, scientists will focus next on how the spring bloom is structured by mesoscale eddy currents, plus conduct an intensive study of the organisms within the bloom. We have people looking at grazing by, by zooplankton, like copepods that people are quite familiar with, to microzooplankton, which uh, turns out are probably one of the more important grazers of phytoplankton. So that's sort of the bottom of the food chain. I'm looking a little higher at the mesopelagic fish and squid. When we started diving into the shark data and, and looking at how they're using the eddies, it allowed us to develop these hypotheses as to this observation of this behavior. But we, we very quickly found out that there was a real lack of observations of these mesopelagic fish and these organisms at depth inside eddies versus outside of eddies. I mean, in general, they're just very unobserved. Peter Galbe points out that observations are only a first step. The next step will involve you know, refining our hypotheses and, and looking at the mechanisms, and then hopefully, eventually, we can get an understanding, a mechanistic understanding of what happens when we increase the temperature of the oceans, or when we decrease the biomass by fishing, these processes that allow us to forecast what happens in the future. Science at work for you. This is APL, the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle.